lot of people know kind of what AA is. Just a moment about what Al-Anon is, because I don't think that's as, as well known. Al-Anon is, I call it like the sister program to AA. It's where family members of, you know, if you have a family member that's struggling with alcoholism, you join Al-Anon. We get together, we talk about our, struggle mem our, our struggles as, as family members. It was actually founded by the wife of the guy that founded AA, which I think is kind of fitting because it, I think these really go together. When they go together well, it actually addresses the disease better because it truly is a family addiction and we'll talk about what that means. Um, but so here we are talking about addiction. The, I'm gonna tell a story about my brother who grew up as, in, growing up he became a crack cocaine addict and then Jam's gonna talk about his road to recovery from a heroin addiction, but just one other little minute before we get into the stories about how we landed on this stage, which is kind of a couple things happened together, sort of like the perfect storm. The, the first was that I actually started going to therapy myself, and I started going to therapy a couple years ago because I was just having, honestly, a really hard time dealing with my brother and his needs and what he was going through. I also had two little kids and a mom, and I was like, I can't, like, this is, like mercy, you know, please like somebody, my friend who's in the audience today referred me to a therapist and it was one of the best things I think that I did. So that happened a couple years ago and she said, you need to talk about this stuff. So that was one thing. The second thing, I'm giving a little shout out to Sharon if you're out there, my manager on live stream in New York, Sharon, thank you for nudging me with the appropriate force <laughs> to, you know, she said, Carolyn, you've been here a long time at Google, like you need to find your voice again. And I was like, well, what does that mean, find my voice again? You know, find something you really care about outside of your core work responsibility. And probably everybody's manager says that at some point. So you go on to our internal systems and you're like, I'll become a coach or I'm gonna take this one-on-one -on -one class on allyship or whatever. And so I did that and I was like, oh, this is like, this is not what Sharon means. Like, <laughs> my voice. And the third thing that happened was I got an email from Anne, who is one of the co-organizers of the conference today, and she sent out a call for speakers last, like December or November, saying, hey, we want to put on this mental health conference in Chicago, like, who wants to talk? And I was like, mm, <laughs> no. But I, then I, like, I was like, okay, find my voice, Sharon wants me to find my voice, so. I reached out to Anne and I was like, Anne, what, like, what do people talk about at these conferences? And so she shared some of the talks that people were going to give. And I, I read some of these things, and I was like, holy shit, these are some brave people to get up and talk about. If anybody was here yesterday, like, it was amazing, the stories that people were talking about, and the stories afterwards in the micro kitchens and stuff. So I already know that we're touching people with this conference. Um, the second thought, though, that I had after reading that was like, oh my god, nobody's going to talk about addiction. And like, we cannot have a mental health conference in Chicago without somebody talking about addiction. And I was like, shit, I think I just found the voice that I need to find, <laughs> you know? I was like, it's there, <clears throat> it's gotta come out. And I was like, okay, Anne, like, I think I can talk about this. And as soon as I did that, I sent a text to this man and I said, hey, Jam, you're like, you don't even know me at all because the rock concert happened much later. I said, you don't even know me at all, but like, I've seen the talks that you've done at high schools to, kids and it's powerful stuff and people need to hear your message and I said like this is a different audience than a high school gym I said but I know I'm not the only one with family members here at Google somebody came up to me in the micro kitchen this morning she said I'm very I'm going to be very touched by your talk because I have a brother that's dealing with a heroin addiction right now so I said I know I'm not so thank you for validating that I'm not the only one with a family member I said I'm also not the only parent here at Google that worries about our kids right and I'm certainly not the only one that, you know, I know there are people that struggle with their own addictions at Google. So I said, please, come do this talk with me, Jam. In like five seconds, he's like, I don't even know who you are, but like, yeah, I'm gonna come do your talk with you. It's like, thank you, thank you, you know? Yeah. So that is how we got um, on this stage today. And with that, I'm gonna go into my story, which starts with this picture here. This is going back a long time ago. This is me, cute little Carolyn. This is my oldest brother holding me, my twin brother and my brother Carl that we're gonna be talking about today some. So this is what a typical Sunday morning looked like in our household. Like, we were very, I grew up in Evanston, happy, sort of, you know, middle class family. My parents were both musicians. You'll see there's like a little music theme going on today. Um, and we would wake up often on a Sunday morning, 
my dad played the trombone, and we, would, we were all required to get our instruments out and jam, Sunday morning style. So this is kind of what it looked like. And it was a very happy household for a lot of years. We would do this Sunday morning, then WWF would come on, we would do the Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant thing, and then we would watch the Chicago Bears lose at 12 o'clock Central. Got a lot of nodding heads. Yeah, right yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, we're babies of the 70s here. Um, and this was like a very happy home. Uh, and I, I say that because I think a lot of times people think addicts come out of unhappy homes. And we'll hear a little bit of a story about difficulty in, in early years. But we had a very happy home um, growing up. And, but then comes high school. And if chapter one is like happy home, chapter two is called the diagnosis. And the diagnosis was my dad being diagnosed with cancer. And I remember how it went. We're all the four of us in the basement, you know, like typical basement, like just junkyard, you know, toys. And we had a pool table. My mom and dad come down to the basement, and they sit us down. And, they, and my mom, it was, says, kids, we have something to tell you. Your father's been diagnosed with cancer. And we were like, OK, we, we know that word is terrible. And my brother Carl says, I remember this, like, can't they just cut it out? Like, surgically remove it. And of course, that was not the kind of cancer he had. So he started chemotherapy the next week. And the, the chemotherapy on and off for the next decade. And in that decade, you have hope, right? And then you lose your hope. And there's, you know, you're looking for remission, and remission doesn't happen, and you know, on and on. And, and it, we're going on and on, too, because life has to go on and on. And so on and on, you know, for, for my brother looked like, you know, this is high school prom, like sweet Carl and the white, like did everybody wear white tuxedos in these years? I don't know. He was trying to learn how to be a man. And my dad was dying in front of him, a very slow death. Um, and life went on for me too. I you know, turned to my violin as a, frankly, a source of coping. Um, it was a way to escape, you know, and my parents had their 25th wedding anniversary, some here in here too. And I want to talk a little bit about the different coping mechanisms, because I think that's where it started originally going wrong. So coping for me, yes, it was music, but I want to tell a little story. And it's if anybody sat in a coaching session with Sally Anderson and she asks you what your superpower is, like I know my superpower is my ability to compartmentalize things. And a story just to illustrate that is. I wake up one morning, I'm in high school, my dad is sprawled out on the floor in what turns out to be a diabetic coma, which is a pretty common side effect of chemotherapy. We call 911, the ambulance has come, the paramedics come in, and they're trying to talk to him, and he can't talk because he's basically just you know, completely out of it. And they're like asking me what his name is, and I'm like, well, Edmund Dehnert, D-E-H-N-E-R-T, and I'm spelling, I always have to spell my goddamn name. Thank God I married a Moyer. That's easier to spell these days. Um, but you know, it was D-E-H-N-E-R-T, and they're thank you. And they put him on the stretcher, and they took him off to Evanston Hospital. And I remember then thinking, OK, I'm going to go catch the bus and go to high school now. And, and I, that's what I did. I got on the bus. I went to high school. I took the physics test, and I aced it. And since that day, this ability to like put tragedy over on this side in its place for when it can have time to be addressed was very useful. And then I could go on with the rest of my life over here. And so I find that I'm able to really do that quite effectively. Unfortunately, my brother was not able to cope in that same way. And he started turning to alcohol in high school. By the time he went off to college, it started to be cocaine. And eventually, he turned to crack cocaine. And he really spiraled pretty pretty far down. And so at this point, when the one time Jam and I rehearsed this, he said, tell me more about you know, what Carl's relationship was like with your dad during those years. And this image flashed into my mind, which, which I shared with him the first time, which was you know, there was a day. This is probably He was probably out of college at this point, living in the men's residence at the YMCA in Evanston, which is like a very not the place you want to end up, but that's where he was, because he couldn't hold a job and pay rent. So he's the men's residence. And he comes home, and he's ringing the doorbell. And he's ringing the doorbell. And he's calling the house phone. And he's ringing the doorbell. 
And me and my twin brother, who were still living at home, were like looking at each other like, anybody going to answer the door? And you know, my dad's on the coat couch, and he's you know he's like getting looking sicker over through the years here, and he's starting to look like a cancer patient. And my dad goes and answers the doorbell, and Carl's like, I can't stay at the men's resident. I can't do it. It's cold. And just let me come into the living room. I swear I'll leave at you know nine o'clock. Just just like I just you know like in a in a mania kind of a thing, like with a desperation. And my dad's like, gets a blanket and throws it on the porch and says, you can come home when you're sober, and closes the door. And I was like, me and my twin brother like, ooh, that was bad, <laughs> you know? And I thought of another story jam that in these years, my, my twin brother's a DJ, and in that basement where we all used to play, he would keep these crates of albums. One day, Carl goes down there, takes the crates of albums, goes to Howard and Western, pawns them at the thing, and sells them and goes and gets some drugs. When my father found out about this, he so like called us together because, of course, my twin brother was like furious and you know just all kinds of anger coming out. And my dad was like took it upon himself to tell us this biblical story, which I'm going to completely get wrong, but it was like it was the Cain and Abel story, right? One brother kills the other brother, and God says, "I am still going to protect this first brother," and he's telling us this story. In essence, he's saying, I don't care what Carl did to you guys. He is a Danert, and we're going to love each other. <laughs> I was like, OK. And as I think about those two stories together, when you like, spark my, my thought there, I think what I, what, what I learned from this and why those stories stand out is that he was trying to explain to us, like, you can unconditionally love somebody at the same time you put up very strong boundaries. Like Those two things have to exist at the same time if we're going to like make it as a family here. So eventually, my dad dies from cancer. And I remember at the funeral, my, my oldest brother saying, thank God, Dad, you're not in room 3951 at Evanston Hospital anymore. You know, thank God, Dad, you are not in room 3951 at Evanston Hospital anymore. In other words, like I am so relieved this is over. This is over. It's been a decade of like awful. And Carl, I think, had a completely different response when my dad died, which is like falling into utter despair. Because dad's gone, he can no longer change that the last days and years that my dad was around, like he was an addict in active addiction and with all kinds of crazy behavior. Like he could no longer like change that in my dad's brain. So you know, what that started to look like over time comes down to sort of, this is kind of what it all added up to over the years. And this is something what he wrote when he was in recovery at one of the, one of the places, his lifetime treatments for alcohol and drug. And my dad died in 94, this like little break right here. So in, you know, he was trying to deal with some of this stuff in the last years of my dad's life. And then my dad died. And you'll see there's a 10-year gap there. And I think that's when he was in active addiction and just you know, wasn't, wasn't trying to deal with any of this stuff. And I mean, I know, I, I, I have been in many of those places myself, you know, dragging him, checking him in, going to the one-week ceremonies where you celebrate the sobriety at one week. And I mean, I did that many times. But also through those years, I mean, there was a lot of anger. Because I think when you love somebody so much, but you haven't done the work on yourself to be able to put up the right boundaries, what comes out is a lot of fucking anger, right? A lot of anger through those years. And so one of the things I was talking about, Alan, on helping family members, one of the things we talk about is like, you need to own your own stuff. Like you need to deal with yourself because this really is your behaviors, um, your, your dealing with your own behaviors can help this person. So I want to talk a little bit about like what I was feeling and going through in these years and um, stop trying to put it on my brother. So one of the things you do when you're a family member of um, somebody that you love that's struggling in this way is you enable them, right? And enabling them looks like, in this example here, um, my brother coming to me one year, I think it was 2003, which was the year I joined Google, and saying, hey, Carolyn, I need some money. 
Um, and I knew he needed money. I knew what he needed the money for. But I actually needed a car. <laughs> so he's like, I got this car. I'm going to sell you this car at $5,000. I'm like, actually, OK. And you justify your enabling behavior to yourself by saying, well, I'm getting something out of this, too. Like, I sort of know what you're going to do with this money. But like, you know, maybe you'll also pay the rent with that money, too. All right. So in the car is this CD. I haven't seen that in a while. This CD was produced by this man's record label right here. And that's how we became friends, because my $5,000 check basically went to pay for this CD and my connection to Jam, and it was worth every penny for getting me up on this stage, so thank you. So it's, it's, a, it's a great album. Um, so and that's what enabling looks like. And the other behavior, I think, I want to say you, but like I'll just speak for myself. Like you, I did a lot through these years, is what I want to call like thinking I'm all powerful and almighty. And what that looks like is, you take your brother, and you make an appointment with his doctor, and you then go in with your brother, and you go, "Hi, Dr. Ebahara, I'm Carl's sister," and you know Carl is strung out, and this doctor is looking at me like, "Why aren't you here?" And Carl signs the HIPAA paperwork, and I go, I'm here to discuss how you've been treating him. Please print out his medical records. <laughs> so Dr. Eberhard is like, OK. And he prints out 63 pages, double-sided. And I go, please take me through how you've been treating him. <laughs> and he's like, this doctor was like, I don't know what woman just walked into this Ooh. room. <laughs> but you know, I was like, oh, so he has back issues. OK. And you referred him for an MRI. Okay, did he? I don't see that he got the MRI. No. Okay, another year later, he's got like neck issues. Okay, Oxycontin. All right, how many years, Dr. Ebahara, are you going to pre prescribe this Oxycontin here? And here I see it on here twice in the same damn visit. <clears throat> okay, so that's what you do when you think you can actually save this person. You think you have enough power that I am bigger than his disease, and I am going to go fix this for him because he's not capable of doing it himself. And by the way, this doesn't really work. Like, because clearly this was like only one source of where he was getting these pills, because you could go down to Howard and Western and get them today if you wanted to. But I felt victorious. I was like on my own high. I was like, yeah, I saved him. And clearly, you know, that did not save him. OK. So then, so that's like behavior number two is like, I can do this. Behavior number three is when you realize, I actually cannot save. I, I actually don't have the power over this disease to save this person. And what that looks like is you get a text like this. It says, I think I need to go to the ER. I'm not going to make it tonight. And you write back, you will make it. The ER is a good idea if you need real help. Love you and talk to you tomorrow. Yes. And you put the phone down, and you go, holy God, please let him make it through the night tonight. Please let him make it through the night tonight. And he made it through the night. And when I was telling Jam this story, he goes, you might have saved him that night. Yeah. And I was like, thank you for saying that, because it's a really scary place to be, to go, I am powerless over this disease, and I got to let you do it yourself. <laughs> so he made it that night. And if you're also really lucky, you get a text like this someday that says, thank you for helping make me a strong man. And you know, if you were here, he's, he's here, on the, he's at work. <laughs> I would say, you know, thank you for helping make me a strong woman. Because I know I am much stronger for having been in this family addiction with you and doing the work that I need to do to, to help you. So. That's the end of my story. She's making me I'm cry. I'm just going to leave like, I don't know. You're oh. supposed to cry. You're supposed oh. to cry. Uh, so there are, um, before Jam gets into his story, there are a lot of resources we have at Google. We have an Al-Anon group. There are only 37 people globally that are a part of this Al-Anon group. And I know there are more than 37 people that have family members, right? Yeah. There are also groups for um, sober 
living. I think the group, there's a lot of groups for sober living. So people that don't want to drink alcohol or are alcoholics, there's a lot of, so, you know, we love you guys too. Please, you know, partake of some of the Google resources if you can. Shall we go back in time with you? Yes. Story? Yes, let's do it. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up. Do it. It's easier for me this way. Thank you, Carolyn, for that. It was amazing, making me cry a little bit, exposing my softiness. <clears throat> All right, so as Carolyn has mentioned, uh, my name is Jam Alker, and I do these things, and when you do talks like this, you're asked to start with talking about who you are, so who am I? Um, I am a national recovery advocate, um, national recovery speaker. I'm a national recording and touring artist, musician. I have a documentary that's being filmed about my stories. Some of the guys are here right now. I have an album that is out right now that you could download on iTunes, you could stream it on Spotify, you could buy this album anywhere, and music is sold these days. And so I was taught that that's who I am. When I started to think about my first intro, those are the first things that I put down. Society teaches us that that is who we are. But for me, what I have to remember first and foremost this might not make sense to everybody, but for me, what I have to remember first and foremost is that I am a person in long-term recovery, that I am a grateful recovering addict. I have to keep that first because all of the things that I listed before, the accolades, the titles, any of those things, those are all just gifts of my recovery, just gifts of keeping this recovery first. And if I get this twisted and I put any of those things ahead of my recovery, I know what will happen. When I speak in front of a group of people in recovery and I say that, anything I put ahead of my recovery, what will happen? They'll all say in unison, you'll lose it. And I will say, no, that's not true. I don't believe that. I will not lose it. I will give it away. I will not lose it. I will give it away. I've seen it. I've done it. I didn't lose half a million dollars in a couch cushion somewhere. I didn't absentmindedly uh, leave that uh, record label that Caroline was talking about, the recording studio where that album was recorded. I didn't absentmindedly leave those things in the back of a cab one day when I was in a hurry. And I didn't misplace some of my dearest relationships. I didn't lose those things. I gave them away. I gave them away in bars. I gave them away in basements in bathrooms, and on the back streets of the west side of Chicago. I said that I am a person in long-term recovery. I also said that another way of saying that is a grateful recovering addict. When I was sitting in treatment four and a half years ago, I heard for the first time someone come in and refer to themselves as a grateful recovering addict. Now, some people, when they say that, they just mean they're living with an attitude of gratitude. Other people say that, and they truly mean that they are grateful for this disease. They are grateful for this affliction. And I am now one of those people. Couldn't have imagined it four and a half years ago, but I can stand before you today and say that I am actually truly grateful that I am an addict in recovery, that I have this affliction, that I have this disease. Because for me, it took getting to those depths. For me, it took getting to that bottom, not being saved. It took getting there to my own personal hell for me to finally have the, the strength and the courage to actually truly change my life. I do a lot of this now, I talk to a lot of people and I see that most if not all people are addicted to something. And some of it's, you know, maybe better than others. But it could be something like Facebook or should I say Google? <laughs> technology. It could be, yeah, technology, it could be porn. It could be what's in your pantry or in your refrigerator. It could be work. There might be a few workaholics in this room right now. Now, my disease of addiction, as we'll talk about a little bit further, came from some of the underlying trauma. I was miserable. I grew up miserable. There was something inside of me that just never, ever, ever felt right. 
The reason why I say I'm grateful is that if I wasn't one of those people, if I was instead one of the people who came home at the end of the day miserable and just flipped on the television and zoned out until I went to bed and did it the next day and the next day, I would have gone through my whole life being miserable, but just not quite miserable enough to actually change. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful that this thing took me to that place where I truly changed my life, and I have truly changed my life. So talking about this journey of recovery, it started for me four and a half years ago, curled up on a plastic mattress in a detox facility. I was shaking. I was puking. My bones were aching, dehydrated. This is what feeling dope sick is, withdrawing from heroin numb, and I was shitting myself. Not figuratively, literally shitting myself, laying on this plastic mattress. And I remind myself of that, and I talk about it in front of people all the time. It's important that I talk about it. It's important that I remind myself of that, because the way that this disease of addiction works is it makes me want to believe that I could go back out one more time. Just, I'm sure that four and a half years, that's a long time. I could probably be all right. Just one night of partying, how bad could that be? But I work a program of recovery now. And because of that, I know that if I were to do that at best, at absolute best, I would end up back on that plastic mattress in a detox facility. More likely, I would end up dead. I would end up dead leaving a beautiful six-year-old daughter without a father. And my daughter not only uh, she not only deserves to have a clean and sober father, she deserves to have a father that is above ground. But coming to terms with that when I was out there was not easy. It was not easy to concede this battle. Coming to terms with that fact that I couldn't battle my disease into submission was not easy. So the way I had to look at it was like a nation that went to war. If a nation goes to war and they are fighting against a superior opponent, they can fight, they can fight, they can fight. No matter how hard they fight, they cannot win. Superior opponent, fight and fight, cannot win. They're left with two options. One is to die. Two is to surrender. And that's what finally had to happen with me. Understanding the disease of addiction understanding that it was a superior opponent that I could not beat, die or surrender. Once I finally surrendered to that, things finally started to change for me. When I was 30 years old, I had the record label, I had the recording studio, I had toured the country, played in front of thousands of screaming fans. I had a lot of money, wasn't quite a millionaire, but I was well on my way, had all of these, these things, these things that people would say make you very successful, you're living your dreams, that's what I always wanted, I wanted to be a rock star, I wanted to have money, I wanted to have all of these things. And at 30 years old, I became a heroin addict. At 30 years old, I became a junkie having all of those things. How does that happen? All of this material success and becoming a heroin addict. It happened because I was miserable inside. I don't want to get into a lot of the details, but there was a lot of family trauma. The horribly uh, explosive upbringing. One of my first memories in life is my dad walking to me, towards me wide-eyed, blood gushing down his face. Memory I can place chronologically directly before that one of my mom smashing a whiskey bottle over his head to stop his violent advances. The first time I got blackout drunk, I was seven years old. The first time I smoked weed was also the first time I did cocaine. I was nine years old. By the time I was in ninth grade, I had done everything except for crack and heroin by ninth grade. Why did I do these things? I was numbing myself to that underlying pain, a pain that I didn't know how to deal with. And I've been told by society that these things, these successes on the outside world were going to be the things that fix them. And they didn't. But at this point, I didn't understand it and I dropped deep into a heroin addiction. And over the course of the next five years, I lost everything. I lost all the money, the recording studio, the record label, I lost all of these things. And at the point where I was just about to pawn my guitar, which was my last uh, 
worldly possession. I decided I needed some help. I went to my doctor. He put me on some medication. He told me I needed to go to treatment. I said, no, thank you, Dr. Cook. I'm not an addict. I don't need to go to treatment. I can figure this out. What are my other options? He said, Jam, if you're not going to go to treatment, at least you need to start going to these 12-step meetings that you've heard of. To please him and to please my loved ones, I went to a 12-step meeting at a place called the Mustard Seed here in Chicago, a very famous place where they hold these 12-step fellowship meetings. I walked in, sat in the back of the room, stayed away from everybody, looked around the room. No, I'm not one of these people. There's no way. I'm not an addict. No. I just need to get my shit together. I'll figure this out. I sat through the meeting looking for all the differences rather than the similarities. By the end of the meeting, I convinced myself I wasn't one of those people. I left the meeting, and I went back out for another seven years, the worst seven years of my life, the worst seven years of active addiction, the worst seven years of being a junkie. Lost everything. Did horrible things, lied to people, cheated, steal, stole, manipulated, whatever I needed to do to get that next one. When I finally did, Surrender four and a half years ago, checked myself into a treatment center. I still had this ego inside of me. And I sat down with my counselor. Her name was Nanette. I said, Nanette, I need you to bottom line this for me. I know I'm in a, in a unit with 30 other guys, but I'm a lot smarter than them. I'm a lot more successful than them. So I just need you to sit here and bottom line it for me so I can get out of here. I need you to give me the secret. And she kind of laughed at me and she said, okay, what's the secret that you're looking for? I was like, Nanette, I need the secret. You just need to tell me how to stop doing drugs and I'll be on my way. And she laughed at me and she said, Jam, drugs are not your problem. Drugs are not your problem. And I said, Nanette, I have just checked myself into a rehab. I have just checked myself into a treatment center for drug addiction. Of course, <laughs> drugs are my problem. That is why I'm here. And she said, Jam, drugs are not your problem. Drugs are your solution to your problem. Whew. Drugs are not my problem. Drugs were my solution to my problem. And thinking back on it, it's a horrible fucking solution to the problem. It didn't work. <laughs> like all evidence was to the contrary. But this disease makes you keep going back there. Now I hear this all the time now being surrounded by recovery. The drugs are not your problem. Drugs are your solution to your problem. But at that time, it was the first time I heard it, and it was mind-blowing. It was an epiphany kind of moment. Yes, drugs are not my problem. They are the solution to my problem. My problem was me. My problem was that I kept trying to solve what was going on inside of me with things in the outside world, whether it was fame, ego, money, Girls, relationships. I had this empty hole inside of me, and no matter what I did to try to fill it with those outside things, I always woke up the next day with that empty hole. And I think about it, you know, this is kind of something that we're conditioned towards, right? From the moment as kids we turn our attention to the television, to the internet, to anything, we are told to buy, buy our way out of our problems. We become consumers. We're told when we're kids to buy this toy and life's gonna be amazing, buy this game, things will be good as teenagers. Buy these shoes or these clothes you're going to fit in. As adults, you buy this house, you get this job, you're going to be happy. This is what we're taught. And for someone like me, I feel like I never had a chance. Being as miserable inside as I was, I don't think there's some kind of big conspiracy out there, but companies need to sell their products. So they need to tell you that you're miserable, and if you buy their stuff, you're going to be happy. And I was miserable, and I bought into that time and time again. And again, this is one of the reasons why I'm so grateful that I was taken to these depths because it was in a place like treatment where Nanette said to me that the problem was me, not the drugs. So when I was there and I started to listen to the people who had what I wanted, people who were far smarter than me, finally did surrender and turned that light inward rather than shining it outward for the answers my life truly started to change. I started to heal some of those underlying traumas. Recovery is not about abstaining from drugs, abstaining from alcohol. Recovery is about rebuilding your life, your inner world, in a way that you are happy enough that you don't need to numb yourself through drugs, through alcohol, through porn, 
through food, through work, through gambling, through any of these things. That is what recovery is about, healing that underlying trauma, whatever it might be, so we can stop that numbing behavior. I'm going to end uh, with this. As I said, my life is surrounded by recovery these days, so I spend a lot of time hearing stories from my brothers and sisters in recovery of their backgrounds, their upbringings, their stories that brought them to their knees. And I see you hear about some, some horrible, horrible, tragic things that they've done, that they've been through, that they've used to cope with the hand they've been dealt. Now, my story does not include any jail time, my story does not include any homelessness. That is the way in which my story may be a little different than some of the other stories you might hear told by folks who have been through similar experiences to me and are now in recovery. So those are the ways that my story might be a little different than the other ones you'll hear. But I have a friend of mine who is also in this 12-step fellowship who taught me to find the similarities and to stay away from the differences. And the way that I am the same as every other person in recovery, the way that I am the same as every person who is still in their active addiction, the way that we are the same is that we have a disease that wants to kill us. I have a disease that wants to kill me. But because of the recovery program that I work, because I come and do things like this, because I keep myself involved, because I am of service to others, giving of myself, asking nothing in return, I get what we refer to as a daily reprieve from the disease of addiction. And because of that, I can confidently say to you and to my disease, it will not kill me today. Thanks. All right. I don't know if we have any questions on the dory, Lauren, if you want to put that up there. But I could certainly talk to Jam all day. So I got a lot of questions myself, unless people want to. If you do have questions in the room, if you could go up to the mics, that would be helpful. Um, other, and just for the folks that are on the live stream that wouldn't be able to hear you. Come on. Yesterday, there were a million people. Wow. All right. I'll give you one. Thanks. My name's Thank Peter. You. Hi, Peter. And, um, I work a lot with the mentally ill. Um, my brother has schizophrenia. And you know, as you said, we all find ourselves in addictions of different things, be it caffeine, give it exercise, whatever it is. Um, and, and the world and language likes to compartmentalize things. And you know, you were saved by this wisdom of this, this, this woman. So my question is, um, I still, struggle with helping explain people addiction, substance abuse, mental illness, you know, all of these taglines, disease, right? And, and, and I started this path um, in the late 80s, and it's changed a lot with mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, I think it's more talked about. But maybe you can shed some light on, and both of you can shed some light on the words people put to these different things that, that we all struggle with. That, that would be helpful for me. Thank you. Okay. I think Peter's a good friend of mine. Peter, my, my first reaction is, and I don't know if this is right, but my first reaction is it doesn't matter what anybody else wants to put a label on. It matters for you and your brother, how you guys live in the family together and the words that you use with him. I'm going to tell you something, Peter. At your wedding, your brother stood up and spoke for you at your wedding. And you said to him, thank you for making me a gentler man. Mm. And that relationship you have with your brother, like the words that anybody else wants to put on his disease, like that doesn't matter. Now, I will, so that's my first reaction. And I love you. And you're a very good brother to him. Um, the, the second thing is, and I'm actually curious, your thought on this. We were talking about this yesterday. Folks were saying, you know, I am not 
you know, bipolar. I am not an addict. I am somebody who struggles with this disease. You called yourself a junkie. What do the words mean for you, and how would you want somebody to talk to you? So I think underlying that and, and underlying what you're talking about with the weight that's put on certain words, what, what we're really getting at here is stigma, right? Because the words don't necessarily matter unless there's a negative connotation behind some of the words. So in that sense, I think it's very important to do everything that we can to reduce the stigma. And we do that by doing things like this, right? Coming and putting ourselves out there, open, you know, ripping ourselves open and being the ones who are willing to be vulnerable to show people you know, we're all essentially the same. We've all got our damage. We've all got our trauma underneath. It is manifested differently for each person. Some people maybe are a little bit better at hiding it than others, but we all have that pain to one degree or another. So yeah, I, you're correct saying I am a person in long-term recovery. I am a person who struggles with issues of addiction. Yeah. Uh, I am a person with a substance use disorder yep. are the politically correct ways of yep. saying it. Um, for me, I don't know, maybe because I like to be a dramatic storyteller, you know, <laughs> to say, you know, I, I, I was a junkie. I, I was, but that, it's like any, anything. My, my underlying belief in all of this is that none of us are bad people. We are people who make bad decisions at times. And people who are in an addiction make bad decisions. They are not bad people. In active addiction, did I make a lot of bad decisions? Fuck yeah, a lot. But I know I'm not a bad person. So. The semantics are, are less important to me than maybe to some other people. But it's the same thing with your, with your brother who's, who's struggling with the issue. You know, these are all uh, behavioral health sort of, you know, behavioral health issues, whether it's, you know, straight up, uh, you know, mental illness or addiction, which is, which is, is a form of, uh, you, know, you know, behavioral or mental uh, uh, disease, whatever wording you want to put. Uh, behind it, but because it's behavioral, where there, there are certain times where people act out, it's looked at differently. You know, there are people who are like, it's the same as cancer. It should be treated as the same as cancer. It's true to a degree, but if, if you had cancer, you wouldn't go out and rob somebody for your chemotherapy medicine, right? You wouldn't look like, act like a fool <laughs> to be able to go out and get a bottle of, you know, you get your insulin if you're a diabetic. So yes, it's the same in the sense that they're all diseases, but because this is behavioral, we can act like assholes. We can do bad things. So I just think that it's, that it's important uh, that what's talked about is that underlying it, we're all good people, we're human beings, and we need to be treated with, with respect and understanding and, and empathy uh, for, for, for what we're going through. Gregory. Hey there. Uh, thanks for being here. Our stories are amazing. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, two part question. Uh, first part's really simple. Are you touring? You're a touring musician now. <laughs> How on earth do you do that with your disease? Because, you know, shows the grind of being on tour and what you're around. Yeah, it's a great question. Okay, so please help me understand yes. how you manage that. So, what you're taught in recovery is if you are truly working a program of recovery, that the obsession to use should be lifted. The compulsion to use will be lifted. It's one of the things that's you know, called the promises within certain fellowships. Um, would I have toured in the first year of my recovery? Absolutely not. But I am at the point in my recovery where I am comfortable being in a bar, you know, being around alcohol, am I, do I allow myself to be surrounded with drugs? No, absolutely not. So um, 
But people who are, are doing drugs or using drugs can pretty quickly get a vibe and they know you're in recovery. They're not about to try to do those things in front of you. But as far as being around weed or being around alcohol, I'm around it you know, quite a bit when out on the road. Um, but I work a program. I really, truly have done the work to understand one of the simple like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy things they treat you or teach you early on is play the tape forward. It's like what I talked about, how I would end up on that plastic mattress in a detox facility or more likely dead. I know where that will lead me. And I have this amazing life now. And I don't mean that. I, yeah, I have a lot of amazing outside things happening. Uh, financially, with my music career, with my speed, these are amazing things. But I have this amazing life because of what's happened inside of me. This, this psychic, spiritual change that has occurred inside of me, turning that light inside. I, I don't want to lose this. This is the most important. I'm happy for the first time in my life. And I know where that will lead me, and it's just, it's not, it's not appealing. It's not, it's not an answer, right? It was not, not the problem. It was my shitty solution to the problem. And I know that now. I know that at the, just at my core. Does that make sense? Just, yeah, I would chime in with one little thought here. I know, you know, in my household, my husband and I, we drink a lot of wine. We host Thanksgiving every year. My brother comes and we go around the table and we talk about what we're thankful for. And, you know, his thing that he's thankful for that day is that he's sober. And I th often think with my husband, like, should we be putting this wine out? And I know he is, you know, if he's going to do, if he could go to Howard and Western, I mean, he right. could go anywhere, right? Like if he wants to do it, he's going to do it. It doesn't matter if I got a wine bottle on my table or not. So he's going to make the choice that day, whether he's doing it or not. So thank you both. And that's beautiful that you say that because that, that speaks a lot to the family recovery. You are no longer trying to fix, manage and control that idea that you are, could save him by not having the wine out that day. Yeah is just feeding into the, the disease, the codependency, all of those things that you learn about in the fellowship that you're a part of. Yep. I think that's amazing. Hey. Thank you guys both for your stories. Whew, my heart's beating so fast. I'm Our hearts are beating sorry. fast too, so you're, you're in good company. Yes. Um, I have two individuals in my life that are both alcoholics, and I am expecting my first child. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Please, um, cry. We, we, I promised some, my husband that I was going to cry. So uh, some, you can well, do good. It. I'm glad I'm not alone. Um, <laughs> and sure. they very much want to be a part of our baby's life, and we've tried to help them in the past, and I think we just feel a bit at a loss of how to help them at this point because they are... I think they don't accept the fact that they have a disease and we recognize that it's a disease and we've lost other friends and family to alcoholism. Um, but I think I would love any sort of advice with family members or friends who are suffering from addiction, how to be the most helpful when I want them to be a part of the baby's life and our life in the future, but I don't want the negative effects of their alcoholism to be a part of the child's life. So it's something we're thinking a lot about right now, and I'd love any advice you have on how to be supportive. We come Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We do an Al Anon meeting here at Google. There's only 37 I people. I will be there. You could be 38. <laughs> um, it's Part of it is you setting up your own boundaries, right? I, one of the things I struggle with with Al Anon is, you know, we talk about you can't change this other person. Like, you are powerless over their disease. And, and like, can't totally get with that 100%. Because I do think some of the things I've done have certainly enabled him and prolonged it. Some of the other things I've done, like say, I love you, but I'm not coming to take you to the ER today, have also helped him. So I think boundaries, am I right? Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard. I feel like if somebody's not ready, you can't be like, why don't you go to an AA meeting? I mean, I can tell you how many times I tried that. Like, I would go to an AA meeting with you, brother. And I would. Actually, if he asked me, I, I would go. But I'm not going to drag you there. I don't know. What other advice do you have? It's tough when the person's not ready. OK. This is a great. Uh, topic and each person is going to have their different point of view. And I, I looked at, at it like I do with addiction as, as, as a spectrum. You, there's this idea of like tough love and this idea of, of, of soft love. And there are consequences to either, right? The, if you, if you uh, 
engage in tough love. You still have these boundaries. Like, I love you. Come back when you're ready. Right? So the potential consequence to that is that they could end up getting lost to their disease. They could end up dying as a result of that. The other side of the soft love is you keep providing them with things. The consequence of that is, is it's enabling them, which could end up killing them. So what's the, the, uh, you know, the, the common denominator here is they could end up dying as a result of it because it's their, it's their problem. So this is about self-care. You taking care of yourself, you deciding what you can live with, what's best for you, and taking care of yourself and that, and that baby that's inside of you. Now, my point of view, I lean, and, and most addicts and alcoholics who are in recovery lean to the tough love side of things, yeah. right? I, I wish that I had been given less enabling. So, and the point is, you tell them, I'm sorry, I love you, I love you to be a part of this child's life. When you're done, and you're ready to be sober in recovery, come be a part of their life. That could possibly be the thing that makes them like, shit, I do want to be a part of this child's life. I need to do this. Maybe not. The other side of it, in, in your case, kind of from what I'm hearing from you, is you, let them, you make concessions, you let them be a part of their life. What's the downside for them? What, what is, why would they need to change their behavior at all? They're getting everything they want. Consequence of the tough love, they might say, forget it, and they are not involved in your life from that point forward. There's no easy answer. My brother would tell me, you know, the worst thing you could ever do for an addict is give him money. In, a, in other words, like, don't enable me. Like, I'm going to ask you for money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just don't give it to me. You know, so like that tough love is so hard as the person that loves them because when I sent that text and I said, ER sounds like a good idea if you need to, I love you. So good. I mean, I was dying inside. Yeah. It's like, I hope he makes it through the night, you know? And you don't own whether that person makes it through the night. This has been super helpful. Thank you guys. Yeah. All right. Hi. 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 My name is Gabby. Um, thank you for sharing your stories. Really, thank you. Um, my brother has been addicted to heroin for about 16 years, so half of his life. And there's been a lot of hatred between us and throughout the siblings and the larger family. And it's been really hard for not only me to show him that I love him, but to feel any sense of love from him. So I just wanted to ask, um, while you were struggling with your addiction, underneath all of that, addiction and disease, did you still feel that love for your family? And in what ways were you hoping that they could show you love? The love, I don't think, goes away. But it is absolutely overridden by shame. I felt, and I'm sure your brother feels so much shame for what he's doing to himself, what he's doing to his family. I'm sure that the love is not gone. I, I don't believe that it has, the, it, it has the ability to be gone. Love is eternal. Love is infinite. It's there. It's just buried so deep behind the shame and oftentimes it's that shame that keeps the cycle of addiction going because there's so much pain that goes with that. And here's the thing, with, especially with opiates. You know, opiates are physical painkillers, but they're also emotional painkillers. So we start to use opiates and that pain goes away, not forever, temporarily, and it becomes less and less as we go on, but I can't, I can't imagine that it's not there. But the, the conflict, obviously, from your side of things, comes from the fact that you love him so much and you want what's best for him. And I can't be sure, but I'd be willing to bet that from his side of things, there's a lot of, a lot of guilt, shame, uh, remorse, self-loathing. And so that, you know, I'm sure uh, manifests in ways that appear as though the love is gone, but I, I, don't, I don't think it is. It, it, so he's in active addiction now? Yes. 
And uh, is he interested in getting help? No. Okay. Well, is he is he in Chicago? No, uh, we're from the Philadelphia region originally. Okay. So is he out by Kensington? No. Um, Thank God. Trenton, New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Not much better, but yeah. Yeah, that's a uh, lot of opiate addiction happening out there. But Gabby, for you, um, as the sister, what I would say is, you know, I do this. I think I did it. To, with my brother, even this week, I go, hey, Carl, I know you don't work Mondays. You want to come over for dinner? And I actually got a response, but usually I don't get a response. But I call it like trickling love. I just, and I don't expect much back, but I just trickle it out there. Like, I'm still here. I still love you. But you have to be able to know you might not get stuff back. But it feels good to do it, because it feels good for you to express and reach out. Thank you. There's a question on the dory here from Becky in San Francisco. I'm going to read the bottom one here, Jam. Um, my heart breaks to hear about the abuse you witnessed and suffered. Do you still have relation with, with your parents? Feel free to answer or not answer. I'm mostly interested in the second question here, which is how has this experience changed or affected you as a parent? That's great. Unfortunately, uh, both of my parents passed away when I was in my active addiction. Um, which, thank God, I have a, a program of recovery now, including therapy. So I, so I talk about this program of recovery and what does that look like. I'm part of the 12-step fellowship. I also do therapy. I do uh, meditation. I make sure that I work out, do yoga, all of the different things um, of service to others as much as possible to have some sort of spiritual connection. Um, because of that, I've been able to, to, to deal with the, um, with the issues of my parents both passing while I was in uh, active addiction. As far as how it's changed or affected me as a parent, uh, I make sure that my daughter, uh, she's very sensitive as it is anyway, but uh, I don't, she's, she's never, uh, I've never raised my voice at her. I mean, luckily she's a real sensitive kid, so she's, you know, I can give her a certain look and she, she knows uh, that she's making bad decisions. And that's the other thing I came, was talking about before, you know, no bad people, just bad decisions. Talking with my daughter, one of the things that I've taught her that with all this work that I've done is when we're watching a show, and there's a show that where there is like, uh, you know, a bad guy is not a bad guy. He's a guy who makes bad decisions. So we'll be watching a movie or something, and see, you know, that's the bad guy. And the cartoon should be like, is that the bad decision guy? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember we were talking? Because um, I fear the same thing with my kids, and I, my husband and I talk fairly openly. Um, he, my husband has a niece who's. A recovering uh, from a heroin addiction is in jail right now. And we talk about Aunt Ashley's in jail, and she made some bad decisions, and she punched a police officer, and now she has a felony on her record, and she's serving her time, and we're going to go visit Ashley in jail. And my ki I, I kind of have this mode of, like, I put a little bit too much information out there because I believe they need to have it. Sure. I don't put it all out there, but I put just a little bit out there um, I was walking my, uh, with my daughter in downtown Evanston recently, and I go, do you smell that? And she's like, I go, that's marijuana. <laughs> she's like, what's marijuana? I said, it's a drug. And I'm, I'm pretty, you know, she's like, you know, and then you have a conversation. Um, but that, that's, the thing you said to me that I remember when we talked about this was like, my kids will be drug tested fairly early on. And I was yes. like, really? Like, how old? Like, how old would you get your daughter drug tested? I think we'll probably start uh, once she starts high school possibly a little earlier. I, I think it depends to a certain degree on the, on the behavior of the kids. But what, what we talked about, uh, my, my friend Jennifer Flory, who's here, uh, we, we've talked about this uh, a lot, uh, is things that parents can, can actually literally do um, with, with their kids uh, you know, to, to help in this situation. I'm worried about my kids. What can I actually do? And one of the things that we suggest is to you know, 
uh, when your when your child just early teens, uh, okay, we drug test in this in this house. Sometime over the next six months, and sometime in the next six months after that, you'll get a drug test. It's just like going to the dentist. I'm not accusing you of anything. It's just something we do in this family. We drug test, right? And they have to remain accountable. Then if behavior does start to happen that is questionable, it's not that you're starting to drug test them then. It's like, whoa, why are you doing this now, mom, dad, what's up? Well, you don't trust me? No, this is just something that, that we do. So yeah, there, you know, there are a lot of different things that, that my, my addiction and, and more so my recovery uh, has done to sort of inform me of the decisions that I'm making now with my child at six and, and will moving forward. Any other questions? I don't think there's anything on the door. If somebody's coming, yeah, please. So um, you talked a lot about accepting the addict, and um, I, I'm pretty comfortable around that. My brother's an addict. He's pretty active. Um, can you give advice for talking to family members who perhaps enable, you know, he's in and out of jail, and, and my parents can't let go? you know, yeah. and, and they can't move forward or accept, you know, they're very much in denial about what's really going on uh, despite the overwhelming evidence. Like, how do you bridge that conversation with other family members who, who you know, can't seem to let go of what's happening? It's really hard. I mean, my mom is enabler number one and I think it's probably, you know, I think I probably took the last 20 years to figure out how to be a sister. And I'm still not, I saw something pop up on my phone. It was like, your Porsche is ready for payment. I'm like, I don't have a Porsche. I'm like, oh, that's his car. Okay, why am I on the thing for the, you know? And I was like, maybe I should just pay it. <laughs> like, he needs a car, right? Like, so I still struggle with that and as a parent I think it's probably exacerbated like 10x like this is your child so I mean I don't know Alan on talking about it hearing from other parents how they accept I mean I think the thing that really like blows my mind as I think about it is like if we can getting back to that unconditional love. Like, we're not saying, mom, don't love your son. You will always love that kid no matter what, but you gotta put up some, these, you have to set some boundaries so that they can hit that bottom. And hopefully they, you know, make it through the night. It's tough. Yeah, I think it's really common what, what you're talking about, to be a family member who sees it and then see the parents and I can imagine, you know, with my daughter, like you're saying, uh, how much harder it must be uh, for a parent. I, I would echo what you said. The, I think that, is there any way that you could get your parents to go to, a, to an Al-Anon meeting or anything like that to kind of start talking about it? Like, it's strange because, you know, his behaviors are, are obvious to me. But for them, it's denial. They make excuses after sure. excuse, you know. He Come. got arrested because the cops are, you know. After him or whatever. Right, yeah. yeah, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and I don't even, like, I see it firsthand. You know, he doesn't hide it as much from me. He hides it from them. Yeah. So, and I don't. I also struggle with telling them what what I see firsthand because it, they're elderly parents, you know, I, I don't yeah. want them. And I also don't want my brother to start hiding it from me because for some reason I feel like me knowing what's really going on is, is almost useful yeah. in, in many ways. Sure. And, sure. you know, there was a long period where he did hide it from me and steal and all of those things. and. I don't, I, ha I have this con conflict of, of sharing information with them while yeah. also trying to protect them, while also trying to get them to stop paying for lawyers to get them out of jail and, you know, all of that. So it, it, it's, they're really, really in denial about what's really going on. And, and I don't know whether you have advice on whether I should, should start sharing more of what he's really doing Do you or you know what I mean like I don't want to shock them but at the same time they're so 
oblivious to what's really going on and, and continue to do things that are, are probably not that helpful yeah. to his recovery. So do you think they're open to hearing it? Just you know, maybe, I brought it up many times. You have I brought mean, it up. Yeah. And oh, you yeah, just absolutely. see denial. So, so maybe they don't want to hear it from you, So, which is why I was asking. There are, there are uh, family groups, parents groups. Like I said, my friend Jennifer, who's here, runs a, uh, a parents and a family group. Uh, you talk to her about potential resources of other people, because maybe it's not best they hear it from you. Right. But do they need to hear it? F for sure. But maybe from a peer, somebody who's going through, so, oh, I used to think my kid was, you know, the cops were out for him, but then I saw this and I realized this, and they're like, oh, yeah, I've seen that. I've realized that. You know what I mean? There might be defenses that come up if you say it, whereas if they were able to hear it from someone, another parent who's going through what they're going through, would they be open to that? You know, they're very old school in the sense of they don't, especially outside people. Sure. And, it, uh, you know, there's the stigma of it. I don't think they've even talked to anyone outside of our immediate family about the situation. And, and that's part of why I, I've tried to talk to, you know, and we've caught we've all caught him red handed. And that's where it's like they constantly give him the benefit of the doubt. And then, you know, he gets in trouble with the law. And it's very much, you know, I've had this conversation of I understand you're the parent, but it's it's not helping him to get out of jail right now. Like, but then they the flip side is, I can't go to sleep at night knowing he's in there, and I have some way of helping him to get out. And you know, they all those thoughts go through their head of, of what is happening to him in jail and all of that. So the next day they call the lawyer. You know what I mean? Like, and it's like. I don't know. I feel like I'm in an endless loop. This is why they call it a family addiction, because mm -hmm. so many people are, are brought in. I, I think my, it was my therapist that said to me once, like, it is possible for one person in the system of the family to so radically put up boundaries and, and that you can help change other people in the family. But it's, I feel you, man. <laughs> I feel you. I'm have Gabby and, and me and you, we can get together and, and Jennifer here if you want to talk to her about her family program. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Come on up. Um, I have two questions. One, once uh, the addiction and everything that you've masked to cope with your past trauma, once that's gone, how do you, can you talk a little bit about the things that you do to um, recover from trauma? Like, I know you talked about like, yeah. Um, it's okay. We, we, okay. Jam and I have talked about trauma and that being part of the underlying talking about trauma and talk therapy, I think, is part of the solution. Um, and then another question. Um, what do you do when... You go back to the mic. Yeah. yeah um, you got it. What do you do when you're... Like, we hear about families... Um, who are a little bit too involved, but what do you do when you have family members who don't acknowledge and kind of like ignore? Mm -hmm. I mean, my eldest brother is like, peace out. And I have to respect that too. You know, I, I mean, I, <laughs> my husband and I were talking about this on the way in the car. I'm like, God damn it, why can't he just, he is a brother too. Like, can't he be part of the solution? And that's my own anger, and it's my own, like, why can't he do this? And you just can't, you, you know, they're going to do it or they're not going to do it. And, you know, they may have their own reasons for piecing out. Um, I find, for me, it's just a matter of accepting that that's what they are, have chosen to do for whatever their reasons are. Yeah. The question that you asked about trauma and the way in which you ask the question and then your sort of visceral reaction to it makes me want to respond by saying, in like 12 minutes, could you and I maybe talk off to the side about it a little bit further? Would you be okay with that? Okay, thanks. I think that's a good place to, oh, Jenny. No, one on. more, come on, Mama, Jenny. Jenny. 11 minutes. 11. Okay, let's if go. If there are any more. 
I'm so short. Um, I'm wondering and curious just on, on a broader, uh, I guess, point of view on the legalization of marijuana and how that mm. could potentially increase the likelihood of addiction, uh, especially on, you know, I have kids, 13 and 14 year old, all of their friends are smoking. Uh, they're smoking on the bus, they're smoking waiting for the bus. Uh, some of them have never had a sip of alcohol. They're just mm -hmm. smoking. So, um, you know, just the sense of that, certainly from a parenting perspective, but also your journey and whether or not marijuana played a part in that. So, and, whether, and also just the correlation between the, um, I guess, the illegality of drugs and the draw and whether legalization takes some of that away in terms of it being, you know, like fun and exciting. So this is something that I'm really, really passionate about. I, uh, Caroline mentioned that I go and speak at high schools and middle schools about drug and alcohol education. There's a lot in what you just said. Uh, trying to pull it apart a little bit. Yes, this is very common that you're seeing kids that these, this, these days with the vapes, right? And this is not the weed that, that we grew up with. I know I'm probably the only one in this room who ever you know, smoked a a joint back in the in the day. I, I know it's just me, but if you'd heard stories about it, that joint that you smoked versus what's in these vapes is very different. The THC content is so concentrated, it's it's insane the stuff that's out there these days. But regardless of that, let's just say that it's the old school, you know, ditch weed that used to be out there or drinking beer. The idea in high school is it's not a big deal. It's just weed, it's just alcohol. This is not a big deal. The fact of the matter is this, the younger you are when you begin experimenting with drugs and alcohol, the more likely you are to become an addict. The younger you are when you begin experimenting with drugs and alcohol, the more likely you are to become an addict. This is fact, this is science. I talked about first time I got blackout drunk was when I was seven. First time I smoked weed when I was nine. Combination of that and all the trauma, I mean, Everyone's different, but it, it, you know this is my story. Okay, so should kids be smoking weed or drinking alcohol? Absolutely not. Their brains are not fully developed. This is a critical time, and in that time, in that in those teenage years, the areas of the brain that develop are the areas that include you know the consequence centers of the brain, um, things that lead towards addictive behavior. You know some of the ways that you process these emotions, process traumas. All of, these, all of these things are finding more and more uh, lead towards addiction and are stunted by the use of drugs and alcohol early on. So that speaks to that, right? Done. Now, the issue of legalizing weed or not, legalizing any drug or not. If you are 18, you are 21, you are not an addict or an alcoholic, do whatever you want. Have fun. Right? If you can go out there and smoke crack on the weekend and come back and be a beautiful, loving, supporting human being that is involved in society, I don't care. I don't have a problem with that. Same with weed being legal or not. I, I prefer it being legal. It's, it's regulated, it's taxed, it pays some bills, all the rest of that. These, for, for people who are not like me, who are not addicts, who have the ability to handle it just like a glass of wine every once in a while, Look, addiction is defined as the inability to stop a behavior despite negative consequences. A negative behavior that you cannot stop, that you are compulsively continuing to engage in despite negative behaviors. If you're engaging in a behavior and there are not the negative consequences, it's not an addiction. So cool. That's my answer. All right, like all good joint Al-Anon AA meetings, we're gonna end with a serenity prayer, which yes. I actually had to write down. I got it memorized. He's got it memorized. If anybody knows it, please speak it with, with us. So God grant, God, grant, grant me the, the serenity, serenity to, to accept, accept the things, things I cannot change, change, the courage to change the things, things I can, and, and the, the wisdom to know the difference. difference. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.